I opened my eyes, and when I did, I was in my office, but I wasn't. Everything was white. The light was nothing but white, like in a cloud or something. The whitest light you've ever seen. There's a man standing about 15 feet in earthly terms from me, facing me. He's standing with his arms at his side, but I can't make out his features because it's like in shadows, because the light is so bright, you can't see his features. The light was coming from him, and he was in the light, but it was coming from him. And he spoke to me, but he didn't use words. I heard him say to me without saying a word, he said, I am Jesus. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. I'm Julie Hedenborg, your host. Today, I have a really intriguing guest for you. His name is Rick Bell, and Rick specializes in the ministry of deliverance. Rick, however, was an atheist for a very long time until he had a dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit and Jesus while he was working on the job. He shares that whole story and some other things from his background include undefeated champion kickboxer who trained with George Foreman sparring partners. He was also a decorated police officer. He's an award-winning musician, writer, vocalist, very talented, passionate man. And he's going to share where the drive came to overachieve and all these things. And it kind of goes back to his calling. So I hope this blesses you today. So Rick, wow, so much to cover today. I've been so looking forward to this interview. Uh, Rick Bell, welcome to my podcast. Well, Julie, it is my honor and pleasure to be here. I just, I was telling you, I've been binge listening to your podcasts because they're so uplifting and they're just good and they're just well done. So kudos to you. And it, again, is my pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, thank you, Rick. Thank you. I don't know if you realize this, but at the conference where we met, um, I haven't even announced this yet, but. I won the binge worthy podcast award. You're kidding. Oh my. It's right here behind me. So fantastic. Well, I, I it's know. not me. It's just who doesn't want to hear about God performing miracles, right? So yeah, it was a little kiss from God. Um, yeah. So it's it's fun to be in this type of ministry. And the people I get to meet, people like you, uh, are just part of the blessing. So yeah, that was a fun night. But um I loved meeting you and your book that we're going to be referring to today. Oh my goodness, you guys are in for a treat. Boxing Blindfold with Demons. Uh, Rick, you were an atheist. Your storyline is probably one of the most exciting and unusual that I've ever heard. I think it's movie worthy, but uh, can you start by just sharing a little bit about your background? Well, first of all, let me say, you can't make this stuff up. I was born in 1959, September the 11th of all days, to an unwed Catholic schoolgirl who had become pregnant by a non-Catholic football star from a rival high school across town in Shreveport, Louisiana. She had become pregnant, and uh, her parents were devout Catholics, and she, again, was at the convent with the Catholic nuns. So in those days, the Catholic Church would secret you away, the young girl, and send you to a home where the baby would be born and then placed for adoption within the Catholic Church. It was all an inside thing. They would have a Catholic family in that town who would be looking to adopt a child, and they would quietly place the child for adoption with the Catholic family. So that was what happened with me. My mother was a, um, again, she was 16 years old when she became pregnant with me. And so she went off and the parents that they chose in the Catholic church, my adopted mother and father were, um, a young couple. They'd been married 13 years and, and they were a bit of pretty well established financially. My mother adopted mother had come from a, a wealthy family and, and my dad was, they had a, a business. And it was quite successful, but they didn't have any kids and they wanted kids. 
the problem with they were very nice people they were good people the problem was they were alcoholics and i call them country club alcoholics because they were functional they would go to work and they had their business and they were very successful with that but when they came home at 5:15 every day they went to the liquor cabinet and by 5:45 they were well on the way and by 8 o'clock they were passing out drunk now this was this was five days a week. And then on the weekends, they'd start drinking in the morning and it would go all day. This was the only normal CI I knew. They were very decent people when they were sober. But after the alcohol kicked in, not so much my dad, my dad would just get quiet. My mother would, would become meaner than a West Texas rattlesnake when she drank. And it was me in the home and I had an adopted sister. We weren't related. They had adopted her the same situation through the Catholic Church. She was a year younger than me. We ironically looked uh, like brother and sister. She had blonde hair and blue eyes like I did, but we were not related at all. So it was the two of us growing up in this alcoholic home that, that there, there's a lot of damage done to a child who grows up in that environment. You don't realize it at the time, but it is imprinting you with habits and behaviors and belief systems you're going to have for the rest of your life. It's important that the listeners know this. When you're growing up, those things don't just roll off your back. It, it makes an impact on you, and it can be for good with a godly set of parents who impart you know, blessings to you, or it can be curses, and those things will linger and stay with you. I part of the stipulation of the adoption for me, I had to be raised in the Catholic Church. That's the deal with the adoption. My adoptive father was not Catholic. He was nothing. He could care less about church. And he, but he had to become Catholic, quote unquote, to adopt me. My mother, however, was from a staunch Catholic family. And I'm not bashing Catholics. I'm telling you my experience. By the time I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I was an complete atheist. I am going to believe in what I know is real and tangible, and that is playing my guitar, because I want to be a rock star like the people on the radio that I listen to. So my God literally became the guitar, and I learned to play at a really high level when I was really young, simply because I didn't realize it, but that spirit of rejection that entered me when I was born to an unwed mother who didn't want me. She did not ever want to see me. She was given the option when I was born. The doctor said, would you like to see your son? And she said, no, I don't want to see him. Take him away. Well, even though I didn't hear it, I was a baby. I couldn't have processed that. The spirit of rejection was attached to me. Very important that you understand this. That spirit of rejection was attached to me and started to be with me throughout my life. Unfortunately, the adopted family that took me in, the alcoholic people, my mother, adopted mother, was extremely critical. Every, I couldn't do anything right. Now, it, it, to her credit, that's how she was raised. You see, people just repeat their, the things they were taught. That's all she knew. She grew up in the same kind of environment where they believed that if you praised a child, you're going to de-incentivize them to do something. You want to always criticize them so you motivate them to be better and do more. So that criticism coupled with that spirit of rejection drove me to overachieve in whatever I wanted to do. Keyword wanted. I wanted to play the guitar. I picked it up when I was about six years old. And I had a, a gift for music. I was born with what they called, when I went to music in college, they called it a genius musical IQ. So I taught myself to play the guitar. And I was driven as an overachiever in what I wanted to do. Thank God I was, uh, had a fairly good intellect, a fairly intelligent enough to skate through school without really ever having to apply myself. But I wanted to play that guitar, and it drove me to become an expert at everything I did. Now, I was not consciously deciding that I wanted to, to drive myself to be an expert. It was natural for me because I was on a quest to prove 
that I was good enough, that I could be wanted. See, you can never prove that because it's a demonic attachment to you, to your emotions, to your mind, to your will, your decision making, and it drives you and it is the most uncomfortable and unhappy existence you can have is to constantly be trying to prove yourself to someone. So that was my early starting of rejection into my teen years when I became, you know, the musician that was going to be my, my whole life. And I was an atheist. My God was having a good time, having girlfriends. Fortunately, well, unfortunately, when I became a professional musician at, at 14 years old and I started earning money with the grown-up bands, I would play guitar because I could sing also. By the time I was 16, I was earning $400 a month, which was a lot of money. I bought myself a Trans Am. I also bought at the same time a good time van. Those were popular in the day. And I also bought myself a motorcycle. I wanted a big Honda motorcycle. So my whole mindset was this materialistic, hey, I can do this. My God is the guitar. That guitar is going to give me everything I want, not some invisible Santa Claus in the sky. That guitar is going to do it. So all my focus was toward becoming a professional musician and going on the road, which I did uh, as soon as I graduated high school. My bags were packed. I'd already signed a deal with a booking agent, and I was gone out the door. But that's the early part of my, uh, of my story. One of the biggest pieces of your book that, that just fascinated me was when you were working and your status from atheist, to, well, your atheist mm -hmm. status changed. Yes. And you were you were on the clock too. You know, God can move anywhere, anytime, right? And I would love for you to share when your faith walk really started. I'd love to. I was, uh, when I went on the road with music, that was my first love. Then I discovered something that I, I loved even more than music. And that was training in the martial arts, karate training. You talk about a kid with low self-esteem and rejection. Oh, ho. You get in martial arts training, you start getting those belt ranks, and at some point you become a black belt, you get all the respect, people are bowing to you, you're somebody. So that's like heroin for a low self-esteem person. That's like getting a shot in your arm, that whole karate thing. So I fell in love with that, and that's what I was doing. I was living in Texarkana, Texas. It's Texarkana is a strange town. Half of it is in the state of Arkansas, and the other half is in the state of Texas. That's why they call it Texarkana. There's a highway that splits it called State Line Avenue. One side's Arkansas, the other side's Texas, and the two sides are very, very different. I went to work on the Arkansas side when I moved there. They gave me a what's called a house band gig where I played with this band. I didn't know we worked for the mob, but we did. Because the Arkansas Mafia, real thing, look it up, the Arkansas Mafia ran all the clubs on the Arkansas side, not the Texas side. Texas side was different, but the Arkansas side was all corrupt. The guys that I played in the band with, a couple of them were drug dealers, and they always talked about this place called Mena, Arkansas. Mena, Arkansas. And it was not far, you know, it was probably an hour drive away. But they said there was an airstrip an air, you know, private airstrip in Mena, Arkansas. And they would go up there and pick up the drugs. And they said they were flying them. In. This, is how, this is what happened to me. I'm telling you, it's in the book. They said we would go up there. I said, well, don't you worry about getting, getting caught? He goes, oh, no, no. The, the police are all in on it. And he said, we don't understand it. But somehow they fly the drugs in, they get the money, and it, it's all protected. So it, and since then, it's all come out that that's real, that Mena, Arkansas. So I was in the midst of that. And my whole world, I was working in these clubs for the, the mob, the Arkansas Mafia. I was working with prostitutes. I mean, they worked in the clubs. That's where they would pick up their dates, their tricks. And I was the musician guy doing all of that. Had to carry a gun. Uh, my guy in the band said, you, you have to carry a gun in here. I said, why? He goes, you'll figure it out. So I, I, that was the life I lived. 
So I became this karate instructor while I lived there. I, I trained every day. That's all I wanted to do was train from morning to night. Then I had to go play gigs, you know, at 10 o'clock at night. And I'd play till two in the morning and then party all night. But I wasn't really into drinking or drugs at that point. I was doing the karate. I wanted to, you know, be healthy so I could do my fighting. I wanted to be a champion fighter. So part of my job was I worked at the karate school, but I became a black belt. And it was a combination. There was something back in the day, Julie, called Nautilus Fitness Centers. Some of you may remember those. So there was a Nautilus Karate Center. We had a combination school there in Texarkana on the Texas side. And I was uh, one of the karate instructors there. There were a couple of us, three of us. And I was also a salesman for the fitness center. When people would come in, we would sign them up for a membership in the Nautilus Center. And it would cost, you know, $30 a month or something. So I'm working as a salesman slash karate instructor. I was the number one salesman because I had a gift to communicate with people. I knew how to, I just knew what they wanted to hear. Now, I've come to find out as I've gotten into, you know, the God stuff over the years, I was born with something called an empathic ability. I'm an empath. Okay. That's not some new age weird thing. It's a real thing. I didn't understand why I would feel things so much more defined than other people. So when you become a Christian with that empathic ability, it goes on steroids because the Holy Spirit starts driving that. You get in alignment with the heavenly and that empath in you comes alive. Believe me, that's where that prophetic stuff comes from. So I was an empath and I'm I'm, I never miss a sale. And it was my turn. It was about 5, 15 in the afternoon. And here come three prospects, we call them, people. They walked in. It was my turn to take them as the Lord would have it. So I approached two guys and a girl. They were all in their mid-20s. And I did my spiel. Hey, I'm Rick. Welcome to the Nautilus Center. Let me show you around. All right, I did, I did my whole spill. Did the tour. They're looking at everything. They're going, this is fantastic. We, did, we didn't know it was this much. You had this much stuff. And I'm like, oh, yes. And we want to include you as part of our fitness family. We finished the tour and they're going, we're, we're impressed. I got to tell you, this is amazing. I said, come on in. Let's get you started. There's no reason to wait another day postponing the most important thing in your life, which is your health sit right down. They came in the office. They sit in the chair, two guys and a girl. Uh, a couple of them are married and the other guy's their friend. And I give them my pitch. It's about five minutes. And I take my pen and I say, here, all I need you to do is authorize. And I lay the contract and I put the pen where it's pointing where they sign. It never failed. They looked at me and said, Rick, we love the club. It's, it's amazing. I said, I'm glad you do. I can't wait to get you started. They said, well, we have to go home and pray about this. And then we'll come back tomorrow and let you know what we decided. And I had all this sales training, and that's called an objection, which I never got objections. But whenever you get an objection, you have to answer it with a question. You keep them talking. If you keep them talking long enough, they'll talk themselves into it. So the only question I could think of was, well, pray about it. He said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, we're Christians and we don't do anything unless we pray about it. Now, listen, these three had come out of the Jesus movement. If you know what I'm talking about, there's a movie, I think it's called the Jesus movement, that started out in California. And the, the, the Jesus freak thing, these were three that came out of that. It was the tail end of it. This is 1980. So they'd, they'd come out of that. That's where they got saved. Now, they were radical. Those Jesus people were radical. So they said, we need to pray about it. Think of a question, Rick. What can I ask them? The only thing I could think of was, well, uh, what church do you guys go to? It's all I knew. I didn't know anything about Christian stuff. I was atheist. I said, what church do you guys go to? Trying to keep them talking long enough to get them to sign. He said, well, we go, we attend a non-denominational 
church. We don't really have a title. He said, it's a charismatic church. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, we believe in something known as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I said, gifts. Now I'm thinking, keep them talking. What do I say? I said, gifts. Oh, I said, so you guys bring presents to church to give to the poor people. I get that. So like every day is Christmas. Those are the gifts. You go and buy gifts and bring them to church. He said, no, um, not that kind of gift. It's a supernatural gift. Supernatural? He said, yeah, we believe that you can lay hands on sick people and pray for them to recover. We believe in um, prophetic words. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We believe, whoa, 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 what did you say? What's that about a tongue? He said, well, it's a heavenly language that you pray and God will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and he gives you this prayer language. I said, well, what language is it? He said, well, we don't know. Sometimes people know what it is. It's a real language. And sometimes it's just an utterance, the Bible says, that the Holy Spirit gives us and it teaches us to pray. And I, I'd never heard of this, Julie, much less heard anyone pray in tongues. You've got to get that understood. Never heard of this crazy stuff. So this guy, this stranger, I never met these people in my life. And he says, we pray in this heavenly language. And I said, could I hear you pray in that language? I never heard this. And I'm thinking this is going to be better than a freak show at the carnival. Cool. These people are going to put on a show for me. And he says, his name was Sam. Great guy. Sam said, I guess we could. He looked at the other two and they, they said, okay. And so they said, just bow your head with us. And I said, okay. So I bowed my head. They bowed their heads, but I started peeking. Sat there for about 20 seconds, dead silence, 30 seconds, dead silence, not a word, not a sound. A voice got in my ear and said, these people are crazy. Get them out of here. You don't have time for this foolishness. Get back to work. I looked up. And I open my eyes and I open my mouth to say, guys, I've got to get back to work. I appreciate you. Let me know what you're going to do. And I was going to write them off. I opened my mouth to say that. And before I could get a word out, Sam looked up at me and said, Rick, the Holy Spirit just told me we can't pray in tongues to prove to you that God is real. The little voice said, ha ha, see. Then Sam said, but the Lord told me, you can pray in tongues, Rick, and he's going to show you who he really is. And when he said that, it was like time froze for me. I'm sitting in my chair behind my desk, wanting him to sign a contract, but all of a sudden that had no importance to me. He looked at me, this total stranger I'd never met till 30 minutes before that. He leaned in and looked at me and said, Rick, do you want to be born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Julie, that was my moment. Something that God had been waiting on me all these years, preparing me for a moment. This was my moment. I could have said yes. And I could have said, mm, I don't, I'm good. Something rose up in me and said, yes, I do. I meant it. I wasn't looking for a carnival sideshow again. They stood up from the chair. I looked up at Sam. I said, what do I need to do? And he said to me, Rick, the Lord just told me to tell you. He wants you to forget everything you think you know about him and who you think he is because he's getting ready to show you who he really is. Now, how would he know that I needed to forget 
my preconceived notions of God. He wouldn't. He'd have no way of knowing that. You got to excuse me when I tell the story. I always get choked up because it's, it's powerful. You know, when it happens to you, you relive it. You go back into that moment and, oh my gosh, I'm an atheist. They put their, they say, is it okay if we put our hands on your shoulder? Bible talks about something called laying on of hands. I didn't know any of this. I said, you can do whatever you need to do. Put their hands on my shoulder, all right? Their hands are on me. I'm sitting in my chair. They said, just bow your head and forget everything you think you know about God. I bowed my head and they began to pray. I didn't hear a word that they said because the instant they began to pray with their hands on me, something started at the top of my head that felt like warm, thick honey. It's all like the consistency of honey. It started running down very slowly about this fast that I'm showing you. Very slowly, about an inch every five seconds or so. Warm, thick liquid. It got to my shoulders and I kind of freaked out. I opened my eyes because something was happening to me. Something was physical. They weren't pouring anything on me. They didn't have anything to pour. Their hands were on my shoulders, but something was coming over me. I opened my eyes, and when I did, I was in my office, but I wasn't. Everything was white. The light was nothing but white, like in a cloud or something. The whitest light you've ever seen. There's a man standing about 15 feet in earthly terms from me, 10, 15 feet facing me. He's standing with his arms at his side, but I can't make out his features because it's like in shadows, because the light is so bright, you can't see his features. And I thought, man, is, he's, he's standing, is it the sunlight or what is this? But then I realized the light was coming from him and he was in the light, but it was coming from him. And he spoke to me, but he didn't use words. There are no words used in that realm. Everything is thought to thought. It's instant communication. I heard him say to me without saying a word, he said, I am Jesus. Come unto me. I'm eyes wide open looking at this white light. I speak back to him with no words. I speak in my thoughts. It sounds crazy, but this is the it, way it is there. You're going to see. I spoke back to him and I said, Yes, Lord, I'm coming. I opened my mouth and a language begins to pour out of me from somewhere deep inside me, just like a river. I opened my eyes and I saw the most vivid, bright colors that I'd, I'd never experienced anything like this. I'd, I'd been, I had great vision. I had 20-20. It didn't wear glasses. I had beautiful, perfect vision. But it had always been like there had been a blinder over me. I didn't know it because it was normal. The colors jumped out at me. They were alive. Colors every, I'd never seen. I was looking like this because it was freaking me out. These colors were vibrant. I'd never seen these colors. I took a breath and I smelled fragrances. Now, this is in my office, the same place I'd been, you know, an hour ago as an atheist. I took this breath and this fragrance that I'd never smelled flowers. Best I can tell you, you know, when you walk into a flower shop, how it smells. Oh, man, it's wonderful. It was filling my office. I had this feeling of being a baby. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you have been born again. The way you feel right now, oh my God, I cannot, it was, I was spotless, okay? I was sinless and spotless at that moment. He said, the way you feel right now is how everyone's going to feel. The moment you step into glory, into my presence, this is what is waiting for you. I was so high. Now, I've done some drugs. I've, you know, I sh would, could shoot tequila with the best of them. There's nothing like I felt when I came to. 
my personality had changed. I was a new creature. My vocabulary used to consist of every four-letter word and some of them that I invented. And that was the way I spoke. That was my habitual language, unless I was signing someone up and I didn't say those bad words unless I thought they thought it'd be cool. My profanity instantly was gone. I never, it was gone. I had no desire for that. I had no desire to take a drink. I had no desire for anything except reading a Bible. I didn't own a Bible. I'd never owned a Bible, but I had this insatiable desire suddenly to read everything. I'm sitting there and I start to come to myself and it wasn't right away. I mean, I had to kind of sober up. Talk about drunk in the spirit. I had to sober up. Sam and the other two are sitting in the chairs across from my desk, looking at me like this. They couldn't believe what had just happened, because that was not normal. I didn't know that wasn't normal. I thought that, that was the experience everyone had. Well, come to find out, it's not. But what happened tonight, he said, this was not planned. We did not plan to come in here and witness to you. We came to join the fitness center, he said. And you sure didn't plan to become a Christian tonight. But God had a plan we didn't know about. So we were sent in here tonight, Rick on a mission that we didn't know, we were sent to, here's the words he used, stuck with me, he said, we were sent in here to ambush the devil's camp and steal you away. Before they left, they told me, there's going to be a voice that comes to you and it's going to tell you, forget it, those people were crazy. Oh, okay, he said, write this down. Greater is he that is in me than he that is within the world. I said, I got it. He said, no, write it down. I had those little post-it notes. He made me write, greater is he, word for word. When they walked out, they shut my office door. They went out the door and they shut it. When the door shut, there was this strange vacuum sound. If you've ever been in a walk-in freezer, the, when the door closes, it makes a, <laughs> makes a sound, a ceiling. It seals. When they shut my door, I think it's strange home ceiling. Like, that's strange. And this voice came to me and said, those people are crazy. Get out of here. Forget this ever happened. And I started to panic because I had this depression, heaviness come on me. Yeah, and I went, oh, it's got to be real. I, I, I saw it. I saw it, the light. And this heaviness that it's, it's all a lie. Those people are making crazy stuff up. I looked down at my desk and I saw that post-it note and I said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And when I said the word world, that thing jumped off of me. Hmm. That sound, that ceiling of that door went, hmm. it went out. That fresh fragrance was back. The colors were bright again. That newness was bright at that moment. I said, this is real. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he spoke to me. One of the only times, you know, I, I heard his voice in my life. He said, feed my sheep. So I went and devoured every, every topic for the next 20 years on feed my sheep. The Lord made this clear to me. He said, when I called you to feed my sheep, what you're doing with your book Boxing Blindfolded with Demons, what you're doing in this podcast, you're feeding my sheep. My sheep know my voice and will follow no other. However, my sheep are starving because they don't have the food, spiritual teaching they need to beat back the enemy. But that was how my, my thing started. I just kind of stay in my own little world with the mandate to feed my sheep. I love the Lord, but I start growing a little cold. So in 2012, I was at the lowest point, I think, probably of my life. Because when you know the Lord and you walk with him in that power, but you let it little by little slip away, and you replace that with money and the country club membership and playing golf 
every other day and that lifestyle of being Mr. Big Shot marketing salesman guy, famous or whatever, replaces God. So that's where I was. And I'd lost everything. I had gotten to a point totally broken. The Lord speaks to me and says, I'm calling you into a deliverance ministry. I said, deliverance? I don't really know the first thing about that. I can't even deliver myself. And the Lord said to me, I know you don't know the first thing about it. I said, Lord, what, what am I supposed to And I knew it was him. I knew. I said, what do you want me to do, Lord? He said, I'm going to put you on a fast track. You have been prepared to be a deliverance minister because of your background in fighting, training with that tenacity of being a champion fighter. It takes a certain toughness to be able to do that and a steadfastness. I put that in you, not so you could have your championship, which I let you earn, but so you at a time like this will understand how to fight spiritual warfare and how to train others to fight spiritual warfare. See, you're a trainer. You're a teacher. You're a communicator. I said, that, that is what I do. I'm going to have you now training others how to do spiritual warfare. You have influences that you learn from other people, but I can promise you as someone who's done this now for over 10 years, you will have your own way and method. And every time is different with, you'll have a general guideline that you go by when you're praying for someone, but it will be different every time. I assure you that. So you don't just model and do whatever, whatever so-and-so does, whatever Derek Prince does or whatever. Those are good guidelines to go by, but God will use you and what your skill set is and your training and the circumstances of that moment to get the deliverance done. So I learned all these things on the fast track and there's so much, I, Julie, I could spend 10 hours telling you how circumstances happened one after the other that started training me and teaching me supernatural things and encounters. But I'm going to let you ask me some questions. No, well, first of all, this has been amazing. You told me some things before that the interview, and I want to make sure we get those in. I love how God has led you to this very unique form of ministry. And you have a podcast, by the way, if you guys want to check out specific things about warfare, it is loaded with information on the demonic and how to overcome and tools that you can apply and use. I've, I've heard some of the episodes, been impressed, but you talked about how in 2015, God gave you a specific message. And I think we all need to hear that. It blew my mind when you told me this. So if you could share that right now. The Lord spoke to me and said, tell my people there is coming a time right now, right now they need to get their addictions, their issues, and all their demonic strongholds dealt with, under control. Whatever addiction you have, whatever, sugar, alcohol, tobacco, anger, <laughs> you name it, whatever that issue is. Get it dealt with because there's coming a time when you will not be able to get free like you can get free today. That was in 2015. The demonic forces are going to increase in your realm. There are going to be open portals that are going to pour demonic forces stronger than ever before, like nothing you've ever seen. You're not going to even understand or believe what's going on around you. The Lord told me, get your spirits attachments and if you're a christian and you think you can't have a demonic attachment i got news for you news flash check your life see if you got any struggles anywhere see if anything's happening like with your kids maybe stuff that you're not uh you're not happy at all about maybe your weight struggles fill in the blank you got demonic attachments we get into this semantics argument whether a christian can quote have a demon or be possessed or be oppressed or, forget all that you can get demon attachments and you got to deal with them. They're evident. The fruit of it is in your life. Check your fruit. You'll see what you got demonic attachments. The Lord told me, tell my people, deal with this because you're coming to a time where you're not going to be able to deal with it very easily. And I've seen that. People have to do self-deliverance. You are the one who has to get yourself free. The deliverance minister's job is to identify your strongholds. I can call them up and I can get them to manifest and probably pull them out for a while. But guess what? They're coming back when I'm gone because I don't live with you. 
They're going to sneak right back in in your weak moment. They're going to bring seven of their buddies with them, like the Bible says. And your your case, your last case is going to be worse than the first. So you've got to learn about self-deliverance, and I, that's what I talk and teach. But it's much harder now to do deliverance on anyone. And if you're in this situation, you're listening to me, and you say, yeah, I'm struggling with this. I feel you. I get you. Let me tell you my personal thing. When I wrote that my book, Boxing Blindfolded with Demons, I bared it all. It's all out there. You can read my whole messy little life story. I was attached with a spirit of rejection from my birth, generationally. My birth father, who I met, had that same spirit. I recognize it now. But you have to teach people self-deliverance because there's come a time for me personally, where God has started to deal with that spirit of rejection that's attached to me, me, the guy that does the deliverance. I'm not immune from it. None of us are. And that thing has started to manifest in my life in the last three weeks, four weeks with a vengeance. And it's not a little simple. Hear me on this. It's not a little simple. Get thee behind me, Satan. I've got power over you. Well, that's a starting point, but there's a lot more to it. If that's all it took, you wouldn't have any struggles. But there's more than that. These things are rooted and attached to areas of your life, segments of your personality. They're rooted in there, and you have to root and dig them out. So I'm in the process of pulling this spirit of rejection out of my life because the Lord spoke this to me and said, it affects every aspect of your life. Everything about my life is driven. This overachieving thing that I have, that I've always, if I'm going to play guitar, I got to be the best. I'm going to be a black belt. Ooh, I got to be a 10th degree black belt. I'm going to be a kickboxer. I got to be a champion. It's permeated in everything I've done, but it's driven from that spirit of rejection and low self-esteem. I'm struggling with that. The first thing you have to do, this is when you recognize, you got to recognize that you have an issue, a struggle with something. You got to recognize it. That's what the Bible talks about confess, confess your sins. That means I admit that I have this issue. The next thing you do, you're going to have to start step by step, systematically pulling those roots out. And sometimes it comes out quickly. Most of the times it doesn't, especially the ones that have been with you all these years. It is a way of life for you. It's, it's the way your mind works. If you had a critical parent and they criticized you, that lingers with you until you're 80 years old, unless the pattern is broken. And it's little by little, you have to undo that. I wish it was a, a, you know, a fix that happened all at once. Sometimes it is if God intervenes in my road to Damascus experience that that happened, he pulled all that stuff out. But then I let it come back in because no one taught me about keeping the doors closed, how they got in the first place. I opened those doors back up unwittingly, but they come in little by little. So that's the message, Julie, that the Lord told me to tell his people, get your addictions. He used that word specifically. See, people say, well, it's just an addiction. That is a demonic attachment. Anything you're addicted to is a demonic attachment. You say, well, it has a physiological uh, cause. Where do you think that came from? You have to root these things out. And if you're a Christian under the sound of my voice, if you're doing anything for the Lord, and I mean, you can be an intercessor prayer warrior, whatever you're doing, you got a hit out on you. Trust me, they want to take you out because you operate in power. You got a big gun and Satan wants to take that out of you. So just start examining your life and, and start to make those changes. God's going to give you the grace to do it. He wouldn't call you to do this. But the longer you wait, oh boy, it gets worse and worse. It's like having a bad tooth. The longer you wait to go to the dentist, the more infected it's going to get. And it could kill you if you let it. Let it linger. If you could list out a list real quickly, what would you say are some of the ways we open the door? Well, it, you, the door is open through your thought life. The Bible specifically says, take every thought captive, because if you don't take the thought captive, it's going to take you captive. Of course, you want to create an atmosphere in your home, in your environment of that praise music of those good things. Words have a vibration. Why do you think you're supposed to speak blessings and not curses? Those words have a vibration. Those positive affirmations that you say, that's putting into the atmosphere anointed, vibrational. Hey, you're, you've got to get into harmony. 
you have to keep your harmonic balance in the heavenly realm by the music you listen to, by the words that you speak, and by your thought life, what you think about. When that impulse hits you, and with all of us, start to recognize those little triggers. They're triggers that will trigger you and choose not to do that. That's what we're talking about here is open doors, not some ethereal new age thing, an open door for the demons. When you get an agreement with the dark side by getting mad and acting out, you open a door for attachments to come in. You may not see them that day, but you'll feel it. You just feel yucky. Why did I do that? I knew better. But the thing you do when you do that, you just repent of it and say, Lord, once again, I'm sorry. Get me back into that Holy Spirit. Turn your praise music back on. You're just pray if you don't pray in tongues and just thank the Lord for all the stuff. Be in a, a state of thankfulness. That's the other thing I would say to you. Maintain a constant state of thankfulness. Be thankful for everything. The breath that you're breathing, your children's health, your house, your car, your job, whatever you have, even if it's a little thing, thank the Lord for that. Because when you're in thankfulness, you're in alignment with the heavenly things. And that is going to open doors for you that you need access to for prayer time, all right? That you, you prepare everything by preparing the ground before you plant something. And that is your ground preparation is your attitude, how you live your day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? You got to work. You got to 24 seven pray without ceasing because it is a spiritual position that you're in. Your spirit man is in constant prayer because of your thought process. And as you dwell on what things it says, here's what you need to dwell on. Those things that are perfect, those things that are good, those things that are uplifting, all of those things the Bible talks about. When you do that, that insulates you from some of the open doors. All right. So I hope that answers that question. Yes. Uh, yes. And I know I've so appreciated hearing your personal testimony and I know there's so much more to it. But it's been amazing. And I want people to know if they want more, where to find you, book, podcast, website, anything else. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. My book, you can find it at Rick Bell Writing, just like it sounds, R-I-C-K-B-E-L-L, writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G dot com. And you can purchase my book there. It is in Audible. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. So just go and get that, and you'll really, I think, enjoy it. It's it's a page turner, and then volume two is coming out that's got the really nitty-gritty stuff where I talk about some of the things I've I've talked about here. My podcast, heavenlywarriors.com. You can look up Heavenly Warriors podcast anywhere podcasts are, Apple, whatever. But it's, a, a, as you said, there are a lot of resources on that. And go to heavenlywarriors.com, and there are resources within that website. And uh, contact information and things like that. If anyone does want to reach out, the best way to do that is by email. And you can reach me at, uh, well, at Rick Bell Writing. There's contact form on there, rickbellwriting.com. Uh, but that's, uh, that's my information. And uh, I'm glad to help you any way that I can. Well, this has been amazing. Now, I always like to pray a prayer at the end over my listeners. There might be someone listening who this is completely new to them. Or there may be someone listening who's thinking, wow, is this habit I have, could this be something that is related to spiritual problems? So if you could just pray a prayer for them. Father God, we thank you that you have made this divine appointment for the person who's listening right now to the words I'm saying. This is not an accident. This was intended. This is their time. This is their moment. Your word says whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Well, Lord, right now we bind the strong man and I cast down every high thought and imagination that would exalt itself against the knowledge that you have given us. Lord, anyone right now who's struggling with any kind of addiction or low self-esteem or jealousy issues or material financial needs that they have, God, I just pray right now that you start to open doors for them that bring them into alignment with your will so that they can pray within your will. And I bind the strong man 
Satan, you have no authority where God's calling has gone forth to an individual. Lord Jesus, I ask right now for there to be a new, a renewed hunger in the people of God. The listeners to this podcast, Lord, a blessing goes out to Julie and all the work that she does for these wonderful, binge-worthy podcasts. There's a reason people are binging these things, and it's because of the anointing that you have placed on, on her and on these guests. And God, I just ask that this podcast be blessed and that it reaches the, the exact person that you have ordained and designated and designed for it to reach. And we ask all of these things in complete agreement in the mighty and wonderful and powerful name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rick. So amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this today. I know I did. And uh, God bless you. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. God bless you, Julie.